Okay, it's a great pleasure for all of us uh, to have uh, on Geotop A Professor Steve Children uh, with uh, a talk on a toy model of the inertial range. To you, Steve. Okay, thanks, Renzo, and uh, thanks for the invitation to, to speak here. Uh, I'm sorry, this is my first uh, time to do this sort of Zoom thing, so uh, that accounts for my hesitancy in getting it started. Anyway, um, uh, this is uh, about a toy model. And a toy model, in my mind, is something that's really uh, oversimplified, lots of assumptions. And we're dealing with a very complex question, which has to do with turbulence. Uh, so what you're going to see is a pretty toy version of turbulence. And I'll leave it to you to judge if there's any use to it um, uh, from the, the results that we get. Um, I'd like to start with something familiar to all of us, I'm sure. Uh, and by the way, I, I should have apologized at the beginning. Uh, I know that this is a geo top uh, seminar, and the geo in the top is going to be pretty minimal in this presentation, I'm afraid. But I will try to come back to some questions dealing with felicity, which are, I think, important. And I would like to uh, present uh, some thoughts that maybe we should uh, uh, think about. Anyway. Uh, a little thought experiment. Let's let's take a box, a fluid, an obvious Stokes fluid. Uh, say say it's the, the the fluid sticks to the walls. We have a little knob here which can control the viscosity of the fluid. And I will consider an initial value problem. Uh, we we somehow stir the fluid vigorously for a while and then stop, and let it uh, decay on its own. And of course, it's a viscous fluid that will decay. And if the viscosity is, is uh, fairly substantial, it's going to start decaying very quickly. And it will come to decay down to zero eventually. Uh, there may be some residual vorticity, and there will be another slow decay at the end, something of that sort. But eventually, it will decay to zero. The, the energy will disappear and turn into heat. Now, if we lower the viscosity more and more, we will start to see that uh, indeed, kinetic energy is rather constant for a while and then begins to decay. And eventually, of course, we get to zero. And if we really turn the viscosity down substantially, we may get a, a extend, extended range where the kinetic energy is essentially constant. And then as if we hit a wall, we start to decay. Uh, there's some question about whether this wall will be hit as the viscosity goes to zero uh, in a limiting time, or whether this uh, keeps growing out. But eventually, regardless of how far we turn the knob, we're going to observe decay. And of course, the reason for this is that these smaller scales that are formed in turbulence become smaller and smaller, and eventually they are capable of dissipating their energy due to viscosity, irrespective of the viscosity. And so we might ask, well, what is going on uh, in this, among these structures where all of this is happening. And if we really turn the viscosity down and, and get to Reynolds numbers that are far larger than anything we've ever seen on Earth, then what are we seeing? Way down there, there's still this small scale stuff. What is it doing? Uh, and how, and, and th by the way, the, the term anomalous dissipation goes with this because the, uh, you would think of it when the viscosity is low, the fluid could not dissipate, but of course it does because the turbulence produces the scales necessary to dissipate. And the, the corresponding fully developed turbulence problem, we, we continually stir the box of fluid and this energy decay uh, is then set up in a stationary way. If we have stationary statistics, we're going to observe there's a continual drain of energy uh, at the smallest scale that are observed, and input of the, uh, an equal amount of energy at the same rate by the stirring mechanism. So these are the two problems that one would like to be able to talk about, even in a toy model, and that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, well, the inertial range then, uh, as we understand it, is then a, a range of scales, which are small compared to the box size, capital L, but still much larger than a scale eta, which is the so-called Komogorov scale, where the eddies will decay due to viscosity. 
And if we're in this particular range, we can reason that, well, we ought to be able to neglect the viscous stresses and deal simply with Euler's equations. And that's the, the assumption we're making here. Mind you, we're not going to be dealing with many properties of these Euler's equations. Um, and uh, uh, it, of, of course, the full dynamics is what is responsible for the true complexity of the inertial range. Um, but the one thing that we will be depending upon is the scaling and variance of, of the equations, which allows us to introduce a lambda scale, which then when we multiply by coordinates, reduces the scale of the structure. And at the same time, if we can lower the uh, viscosity by a certain power of this lambda and also stretch T and the, and the pressure P, the, the equations are invariant. And this in principle, means that we can consider the possibility of arbitrarily small structures, which could be very similar uh, to the to, its, to some sort of hierarchy. Uh, this leads to the picture of a sort of self-similar cascade. Of course, the question is, what, is, what would it look like? Or, or how, how should we think about this? Um, now, I mean, you, you can think of a cascade as a big eddy, breaking up into smaller eddies and smaller eddies breaking up to still smaller eddies. And I've introduced here an exponent. This would be H of one third, which is the, the Onsager Komogorov value and anticipation of that. Um, but really one should think, I mean, it's a question of, of uh, these things sort of being on top of each other. And depending upon the, the um, resolution with which you look, you will see different sizes. And so these should be really uh, overlaid on top of each other. And uh, so uh, uh, big structures are composed of smaller structures and smaller structures are composed of still smaller structures. And uh, you, one can see evidence of that in, in the, actually in experiments. Um, Fourier modes uh, are a useful way of, of visualizing this uh, because uh, uh, in a sense you get a signal which, uh, which is embedded, uh, all of the signals that are present. Uh, and so we see the large signal and the smaller signal and the still smaller signal. Uh, the trouble with, with Fourier modes, I mean, of course it's a very useful and has been a very powerful tool for the study of the inertial range, but you lose some contact with the physical structures that are actually involved. This is the only problem. Um, let me turn to, uh, for a second, to the Komogorov scaling, uh, which uh, or I call it Richardson Komogorov scaling, in which um, we assume in the inertial range that since the viscosity is not playing a role, that uh, in the case of stationary homogeneous turbulence, uh, we should see this constant flux of energy through the system. And that gives us some dimensions to work with. And from that, we can derive the famous uh, laws that Komogorov presented to us, in particular, the average of the square of the difference of velocity between two points separated by L should go in this way with this two thirds power. And we're gonna be looking in particular at the structure functions, uh, delta U to the P and the K41, the original paper of, of Komogorov, uh, would have us then take this as uh, proportional to this L, this, scale, this eddy size to the P over three. So we're gonna want to uh, keep that in mind as we, and we're going to be looking at these uh, exponents, uh, this P over three uh, will be, uh, we're going to look at what they, they are and uh, uh, try to say something about them. Uh, what do the experiments show? This is a picture from the excellent book of Frisch. I, by the way, that's just about anything I know about turbulence, which is not very much, comes from books, uh, the book of Frisch and uh, a, a few other papers, but uh, mainly that, I've, I really enjoyed reading that. Um, you can see that uh, the exponents zeta p, which is what I've, I'm, I'm defining right here, uh, do not really obey the Komogorov uh, P over three uh, law. And rather they have this, this other complicated 
uh, nonlinear curve. And in particular, this log Poisson model seems to be very, very good. And uh, it's essentially equivalent to this formula right here. I, I, you can't see the title of the picture here, but, but this is the Shea Levesque formula, which was derived some time ago by, by Shea Levesque. And it's right on the, the log Poisson. And uh, it is in excellent agreement with experiments. And it's, it, it, it really is based on considerations of dissipation. I didn't fully understand the derivation, to tell you the truth. But I'm going to use this um, formula as a target. We would like to have a model that gives us this target, OK? And this will be our representation of experimental results for the, for the, for the exponents. Um, let's, if we look into tur tur fully developed turbulence, we do see this kind of overlay of, of uh, uh, large structures and smaller structures. Uh, uh, this, uh, these are magnifications, as you can see, uh, of structures. And in particular, in this case, we're seeing a lot, uh, these are of vorticity intensity. Uh, it's a representation of vorticity intensity. And, excuse me, um, uh, you can see that there's a real filamentary structure here. Um, this goes back to uh, the question that I've always had uh, when I think about turbulence is what is an eddy, in fact? And uh, if you look at this, you might say, well, an eddy is a it's, it's a vortex tube. Well, there's a lot of discussion of this among many people. And uh, again, there's a discussion of, the, uh, of this topic in Frisch's book. The, uh, uh, some people would say, well, sheets are important. Uh, others would say that pancakes of vorticity are important. Uh, some would say that pancakes can be flattened and then roll up into tubes. Uh, and tubes can be flattened into pancakes. So it's really hard to say where we should turn for, for defining an eddy. But it, for this particular toy model, we're going to adopt the filament as our unit and uh, just hope that it's, it's of use. Um, there is, though, some experimental results that are very suggestive that this can be useful. Uh, and that's right here, the, the, the amazing and really remarkable uh, simulations and experiments of Magoon and his collaborators at Harvard. This is really, uh, I think, one of the first examples of uh, a, uh, a direct look physically at what we might be responsible for a cascade uh, in uh, turbulence. And what is going on here is we're seeing, uh, much like uh, uh, physicists throw particles together to see what comes out. Uh, they threw two vortex rings together to see what came out. And what came out were uh, these vertical structures, and which then they could, could look at both in simulation and, and uh, in experiment. And they observed the so-called elliptical instability of vortex tubes taking place. And what this instability leads to uh, is you can see right here, if you can see my cursor, these um, uh, tubes wrapped around a given tube. And so that would be one, uh, uh, would be one step of the cascade that, they're, that they're, they're looking at. And then the idea would be that these tubes also become unstable and there will be smaller tubes wrapped around them. So if this and there's all, there's evidence from this work that indeed commode rough scaling may be emerging from this uh, this mechanism. Uh, I should point out that uh, this instability, as you can sort of see here, is is on the scale of the core of the vortex. We're going to be talking about in this little toy model about slender vortices, uh, vortex tubes, and we're going to sort of split them apart. This this has nothing to do with the sort of instability that we see here. So we're, this toy model is not going to be a model of the mechanism that's uh, represented here. Although it's similar in spirit, I'd put it that way. Uh, and this is just a way of, of, of visualizing what I was just saying. 
about the start of this cascade. Um, oh, I wanted to mention something that um, the reason this struck me, this, this work I just described, is that this is a paper I wrote in 1984, and I was visualizing uh, the inertial range as somehow the splitting of vortex tubes. I, I wanted to uh, produce a model of um, uh, the uh, so-called beta model. Uh, and uh, th this model is, is sort of a piece uh, a representation of how a fractal structure might arise to account for some of the deviations from, from the Komogorov. And um, so um, uh, what this is showing is a vortex shedding off two uh, vortices of opposite orientations, okay, and leaving behind this piece, which is called an inactive helix or tube, and th this is then uh, the inactive tube after another uh, process of, of shedding off tubes or to see. So anyway, uh, uh, this is, is a sort of peculiar model, which I, I don't really take too seriously. But anyway, it was a way of, of trying to do something very similar. And this is uh, one reason I've been thinking about this. But now I want to turn to the, uh, the model at hand. And this is work. Uh, with, with my longtime colleague and collaborator, Andrew Gilbert. Uh, and a couple of years ago, uh, we this. And uh, uh, let me summarize the model right here. Um, so what Andrew and I uh, decided to do was to um, uh, consider helical structures. Uh, this is really just an idea, a, a way of, uh, encoding scale as uh, and so you can say that one turn of the helix is an eddy in this picture uh, the, these tubes are going to split apart by some mechanism it could i mean obviously I, this could be some process of, of maybe uh, forming little local sheets and then splitting into two tubes something of that sort i'm not going to try to say how this happens or perhaps it doesn't happen but we're going to speculate that this happens, and uh, uh, so, so we'll then form new tubes, and we're going to have uh, uh, a sort of self-similar uh, cascading of helical structures, so that in the end, one is going to have an iterated helix, just like in that Fourier picture, all the different modes are encoded in one signal. There's going to be one helix which encodes all the other helices, so to speak. Um, so this is the idea. Uh, we're going to try to observe vorticity kinematics. We'll do our best to satisfy energy conservation. I apologize that helicity is not on my list here. But for those of you who would like to see that, I, I'm, I'm inviting you right now to think of how one could improve all this to, to, to bring in helicity conservation. The one dynamical input is going to be the Komogorov's four-fifths law. Uh, this states that the zeta-3, the exponent of the third power of the velocity difference, uh, that exponent is one, as illustrated by this exact result for stationary homogeneous turbulence. Uh, one of the very few exact results, in fact, that we can pin our, our uh, mathematics on. Uh, and so this is going to be imposed as a dynamical constraint. It's the one piece of dynamics in, in the toy. Um, the, the main result, and, and this I'll try to, to make clear several times, is that um, in a sense, this approach is going to lead us into a cascade that consists of two, two pieces which mix together. In, in a way that you'll see. Um, and the end result is going to be that if we do this mixing of two cascades, I use cascades in a sort of in quotation marks because uh, I'll explain that later. They, we can get good agreement, very good agreement with our target uh, Shaler-Beck model, which is our representation of experiment. And so, um, 
uh, we can study in this, we will try to study in this way, stationary homogeneous turbulence in this little toy. We'll also try to look at the, the flux of energy and then look a little bit at the initial value problem to see how energy could be cascaded out of the picture and so we can have decay. Um, so this is the preparation uh, of the model. Maybe I should stop here. Are there any questions at this point before moving into the discussion of the model itself? Is anyone? Okay. Um, maybe I, I, since uh, Keith and uh, Andrews are, are attending, uh, I, I think I recollect uh, works by uh, Levitch and uh, Zinuber, and the third one would be Batchoff. And uh, in different papers, I, I'm sure Levitch and Zinuber have a paper on helical um, uh, structures in turbulence that involves uh, helicity. I wonder if you, if you, <laughs> If uh, yeah, of I, any of any help. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that now. I, I I would have to look back and see that again. I'm sorry, I I, I should have mentioned that definitely. Um, yes, I remember right. that. I think that was in the eighties. I do wasn't? remember. It has to do with intermittency and the and of course coherency of structures. But I can't yeah. I can't comment on the on the on the use they do of helicity there. Maybe <laughs> Keith uh, has an idea. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't remember this paper, and so it's but, um, 1980. Uh, might might be 1984, something like that. Yeah. I, I did. I wrote a review of uh, with uh, Sinober around that time um, in annual reviews of fluid mechanics on uh, helicity in laminar and turbulent flow, but. Um, what we see so far of, of Steve's uh, model here, I mean, they are helices, but um, they have opposite sign, you know, and I don't know if the average helicity over the whole tube is zero or not, but that will emerge, I guess, in the, in yeah. the next uh, slides. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I will try to, to come back to that, uh, Keith. Yeah. Okay, should, should I move on? If, if I may ask a quick question. Sure, sure. Um, in recent times, Luca Biferale and some other people have looked at how two different signs of helicity cascades and how the, if you kind of synthetically change the coupling between them, how the dynamics of the cascade changes. Does uh, this have some connection with your thoughts? It could very well. I don't know that paper. I would love to get it if you could send me the. the Absolutely. Paper. I think uh, there are okay. several ones, but I can send you the link. Absolutely. I very much appreciate that. I, one reason for giving this talk is I'm a little out of touch with some of the literature, I'm afraid. So uh, this will this will help. Uh, I, I should. I mean, let me come back to Elizabeth though, because. Uh, uh, it's a great concern, but we're, we're throwing, it, throwing it out of the picture for the moment, I'm afraid. Okay. Shall I move on or is there any more? Okay. Well, okay, very simple now. Uh, the kinematics of vorticity is um, uh, that we will use. First, we'll stretch a vortex. Uh, rather, well, we won't do that first. We'll, we'll first actually split a, a vortex tube, and then we will stretch it. So these two mechanisms both change uh, the cross-section of the tubes, obviously. The um, volume, supposing this tube splits, preserving volume, then the sum of these areas will equal to the sum of this area, will equal this area, so we can track that. As we stretch, of course, the area goes down uh, inversely uh, as the volume is conserved. And the, the vorticity itself uh, is proportional uh, to, to the length. And therefore, we can follow vorticity by how much we stretch. So uh, let's look, look at the imagined uh, cascade here. Uh, these are some. Uh, pictures that Andrew prepared that, uh, you know, we, we just wanted to try to look and see what was happening with the things we were imagining. 
And uh, you have to realize that this is a, what do we call this, the root helix. And the root helix is going to give rise to two daughter helices. And those two daughter helices are going to have certain scaling factors and everything will scale together. Uh, the uh, uh, cross-sectional area and the parameters of the helix and so on. So as we go through this, there are the two daughters and we've left in what they came from. So now we're seeing actually the two daughters that have the same volume of that original tube, but we've left the original tube in. And now we take it away. And this is the result of that first splitting. And now we go to four and then eight. And you see, even in this toy, it's a mess. Turbulence is a mess. Um, what, what do you say? It, uh, anyway, so that's sort of the picture. Now, uh, let's look at the first step of the cascade. Um, so here's the cross section of, say, I'll call it the root helix. It has a certain area. We're going to introduce a parameter beta zero, which is going to be the volume fraction of one of these tubes, okay? Or one of these helices, I should say. And uh, or one turn, and one minus beta zero, that will give us beta one, which is going to be the fraction of the other, and so volume is conserved. And then there will be stretching, and the stretching will again uh, reduce the area by division by these two parameters, S1 and S0. So we're, we're, we're introducing a binary notation because we're going to be splitting in a binary way. And we'll have these parameters, S1, S0, and beta zero, which are the key parameters. And uh, if we uh, want to get the scale, uh, the scale factor will be determined by the scaling of the cross section as well as the other uh, parameters of the helix. And so we'll have to take the square root of this uh, factor beta zero over S zero, and that will define our two scaling factors, lambda one, lambda two, uh, lambda zero, lambda one. And um, so um, we'll use the notation H zero and H one to refer to the two daughter helices and so on. So uh, we then get a sort of binary tree that describes all the helices that are gonna be formed. And um, now, when I, I said the, the model is a mixture of two quotation mark cascades, I really mean that if we, we go down one side of this uh, tree, we're just looking at the, the, the one helices and how they cascade to themselves. If we go down this side, it's the zero helices cascading. And we can ask, what is the scaling factor for these two? Okay. So that's what I mean by two question, quotation mark cascades. This is like some of the beta model that was or, or any single cascade um, and, and that we're looking at a particular set of structures and how they go down. But of course, the binary tree is gonna mix these up and uh, in, in, a, in a rather simple, but still fairly uh, sufficiently complicated way to get some results that are, that are non-trivial, I think. Anyway, um, if we look at the scaling factor from the, what I've just defined, the way the velocity scales, I should say, is lambda times S, because lambda is the scaling factor of length and S is the scaling factor of vorticity. So lambda S is the scaling factor of velocity. And if you work out what this is, you get this alpha zero one as the scaling factors of each of these two cascades. So I'll be coming back to these later. So now let's calculate our structure function on the binary tree. And, and now we're trying to do a model of stationary homogeneous turbulence. And the assumption is uh, we're going to have a sea of these cascades taking place. And uh, there's going to be continual uh, renewal of the root helices and continual withdrawal of energy, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 
in the smaller in the smallest uh, smaller scales. And so, uh, since it's a binary tree, we have this sort of binomial uh, uh, expression here with a binomial coefficient. These are the volumes we're, we're weighting by volume, the velocity powers. And of course, these combine in this binary fashion. So this is for a given n, that's a given step in the in the cascade on a given k that determines one element at that step of the cascade, we get uh, this contribution uh, to uh, the average. Um, what this has to do is is uh, what, what this will what this will do is is make a certain complication in the uh, the location of eddies of a given scale because if we look at a given scale, say the script L is R times capital L, uh, then this scale will be th this combination. And so uh, if we, we'll have to vary both N and K simultaneously to see what, uh, what pieces of each step of the cascade actually give us that particular scale. Uh, and so this is the expression for a given uh, scale R, how K and N are related uh, by this coming from this expression here. And so this is illustrated here. Um, uh, you can think of the one cascade is coming along this line, you see, and the zero cascade along this line. And these are rays of constant K. So if we pick a scale, we're going to have a range of n, each one corresponding to a certain k. So we're going to have to sum over these if we want to look at the contribution to our sum of a given scale. Okay, so that's the only complication here. Notice that if these two rays coincide, that is to say, if lambda one is equal to lambda zero, then the two individual cascades have the same scaling factor. These collapse down. And uh, we just have uh, uh, everything happens at a given. I mean, other words, all we have to do is look at a given step in the uh, cascade to see all those of the same scale. Now, the, set, the fact that they're the same scale does not imply that the alpha of the cascade is the same because the stretching factors are still there to be different. Okay, so we'll see that now. And this is a, a key point in this little uh, toy model. Because um, let me consider that special case now that I just mentioned. The two lambdas are the same. And you work through this. And we get this expression. And now I put p equal to 3. That gives me the, uh, the and apply the four-fifths law. Zeta p has to be zeta three has to be one. We get this expression. That tells us that lambda to the fourth is this combination of betas. Here we go. And then we have this expression for the stretching factors now, because we have the same lambdas. And then we get this expression here for zeta p. Okay. It depends only upon beta zero now. All right. And what happens? Well, if beta zero is equal to 0.38, then I fall exactly, really exactly, on the target curve. Uh, by the way, uh, notice that I should have mentioned this when we're looking at the experiments. The uh, target curve, the value zeta one is a little bit above one third, and the value zeta two is a little bit above two thirds. This is something that's going to be happening in our in this toy model, and I'm told by that, that recent experimental results are showing these numbers are uh, indeed, indeed greater than the Kolmogorov values, even at this low value. In fact, uh, I've heard that uh, one measurement of 0.7 instead of 0.66 here. So uh, this is is really uh, 
very close to experiment at this particular value. And this is a very special case of our model. Uh, but of course, if you choose other values, you get, you get, you deviate from this. And if you choose 0.5, you get Komolarov. Okay. Now, what's interesting here uh, is that here, here is our Komolarov values. We get P over three. We're stretching. The stretching factors are now the same. Uh, the lambdas are the same. Everything's the same. So basically, we have a single cascade. Okay. Now, every other example in this toy that gives the experimental curve has more than one cascade, has the, has the two cascades. So I, I state this sort of meta theorem that within this little toy model, and that's the reason I call it a meta theorem, uh, nature does not like a single cascade. If we look at the one case of a single cascade, that's uh, the Kamograph value, it's not the experimental value. Uh, so now, uh, let me come back to this point of the two constituent cascades in this model when I choose 4, 3, 8 as beta 0. Okay, so that really, this is, this is right on the uh, experimental curve. And the alpha 0 turned out to be 0.659. The alpha one is 0.158, but the zeta one is 0.346. So it's not 0.33, but it's close. So the mixing, the binary mixing of these two quotation mark cascades has produced a cascade, which is really very close to, to Komogorov at the level zeta one. Um, then I, I should make the, uh, I should note that the, Within the model, we do get constancy of energy flux. Uh, I'm abusing the notation here because this epsilon is now the scaling factor of, from, cascade, from each step of the cascade of energy. And uh, uh, so it's one. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what, what happens here, and this is not that unexpected, even the toy model that imposing the uh, four fifths law is equivalent really to imposing constancy of, of uh, energy flux. Um, I just indicate here that uh, you may not see this, but there's a dotted line here, which is the shale that value out to really large values of P. And uh, uh, this particular scale, this special case, even the special case gives very good agreement out here. Okay, um, by the way, I don't think we, we have much information about what these NFPs are way out here. It's, I think the, the errors get very large if I'm not mistaken. Um, well, now for general lambdas, um, we have to, to uh, sum over various steps of the cascade in order to get a single scale. And so this is what we have to do. Now, uh, and the, I, I, we were struggling with this at first uh, to, to get really accurate results. But Andrew came up with a uh, very beautiful calculation and gave a, a really nice result uh, using uh, the large deviation idea because we're, we're uh, we're introducing, uh, as I said in the previous slide here, you apply Sterling's approximation to the binomial coefficients to sort of deal with the large deviation aspects of this. And then you get a really good result. And it's a beautiful formula right here. It's an implicit formula for zeta p, okay, given p, as a function of beta zero, s zero, and s one. So we have four unknowns, we have two equations. This is the application of the four-fifths law. And so we have two free parameters. So I will say eliminate zeta one, uh, excuse me, S one, and consider the parameters to be beta zero and S zero, okay? Um, uh, let's see, anything else I should say? Oh yes. Uh, 
uh, where, where I, what I wanted to point out here is that you see, this is really a toy model. Uh, where are the helices? <laughs> They've disappeared. There's nothing but stretching and volume conservation. So in, in a way, um, I, I have the feeling that this kind of thinking uh, is so crude in a way that the structures almost don't matter <laughs> somehow. But anyway, I just want to mention that, that uh, it's, it's boiled down to, to just this, this uh, simple dependence. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, I, I'm sorry to hit you with numbers, but I just wanted to, to point out that um, when we solve this, this equation, we get two branches of solution um, for reasons that have to do with uh, the packing of these helices together. I'll, I'll mention this in a second. I'm not, sort of not paying much attention to the upper branch. Uh, I just want, let's look at the lower branch here. You notice the stretching factors. Uh, as you go through these branches, one or more, one of the helices dominates in stretching or the other, okay? Here are the zeta ones. They're all above 0.33, okay? Here are the zeta twos. They're all above 0.666, okay? But they're, they're not too bad. Um, here are the stretching factors, okay, that they're slightly different, okay, and there's not, I'm sorry, the scale factors, they're, they're not exaggerated, really, they're, they're sort of reasonable. Um, here are the alpha zeros, now, these are the individual scalings of the one and zero cascades, and you see they're, they are, are very much like we had in the, in the uh, case. Uh, of equal lambdas. By the way, I, I should emphasize this because I, I want to be sure I'm clear. These are all cases that fit the data. Okay, so we've adjusted all these. Uh, so uh, uh, let me go step back a second. We, we had a formula and we had uh, beta zero and S zero as free parameters. We've adjusted S zero to get agreement with experiment. And then we have a variation of beta. So we have a one parameter family left. Okay, let me be clear about that. Uh, now, I have here two, two quantities, S0 over S1 squared and S1 over S0 squared. Uh, this is one time when we go back and think about helices. And is it possible to make, after the splitting, uh, the zero helix with its own scaling wrap nicely around the one helix with this scaling? Or is, is it possible to make the one helix wrap around the zero helix with this scaling? This depends upon the stretching factors because you have to have the right amount of stretching to be able to wind one helix around another helix. So it turns out that this one, uh, if you're going to have the S0 helix winding around the one helix, you have to have this number equal to one. If it's the other way around, this number has to be one. So we come down here and we see this value here where about 25% of the volume goes into the zero helix. That's where we get that sort of packing. Up here, we get another case uh, in which the one helix wraps around the zero helix, okay? So there, in a sense, if you want to ask me what this is boiled down to, there are two cases here, which seem to us to be the most quotation marks reasonable within this toy model. Um, should, should I pause for questions? I'm not sure how time is going. Uh, I'm almost getting to toward the end, but are there any questions at this point? Okay. I will have a question, Steve, but maybe maybe uh, at later at the end. Okay, it's sorry. Do, well, the, the question, I'll give you warning of it. Um, it's just, this is, a, it looks like a wonderful model, very, very intriguing. But what is missing is the demonstration of this instability, even at the first stage of the cascade. You want to demonstrate it as a, natural dynamical instability of the Euler equations? Uh, yes. That will be my question. That is a very good question. Of course, I don't have an answer, Keith. You know that, right? Um, 
<laughs> uh, let me, let's come back to it maybe though at the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk just a, briefly because I'm running out of time about energy. Um, uh, this is a well-known expression for if you have a an R3 and you want to compute uh, you have a compact arrangement of vorticity, you can do an integral nicely over volumes. Uh, this is a nice way of computing the energy of that vortex system, well-known result. We can use that with, with uh, these filaments. And uh, we could ask if we take a, a given helix and we split it into two helices and we sort of wrap them or something like that. We of course then have some interaction energy between the two helices. and is this equal? I mean, does this make sense? And so we wanted to examine that question. And in order to do that, it's quite difficult to, uh, to have a compact uh, uh, calculation for helical structures, particularly if you have a whole arrangement of them. So we really had to concentrate just on a single uh, step in the cascade and, um, and make some assumptions. We have to use thinness, obviously, to do to do calculations. Many of you are familiar with this sort of thing in order to uh, compute the uh, the energy outside of the vortex, the energy inside the vortex, and then the interaction that you get between the two vortices uh, through this formula here. One thing that comes up is when uh, you have a helix, uh, two helices which are interacting and each of those helices, helices split, then what happens to the interaction energy between those two helices? How do you allocate that to the two daughter helices? Okay, and so you have to make some assumption and we assume that the interaction energy is allocated and proportional to the original energy of each helix. And if you do that, then you get this expression. So the implicit energy of uh, each, each of these helices given by this factor. These are energy factors. This is how much is transferred to the next scale, okay? So these two factors for E1, e, well, oh my gosh. I'm, uh, yeah, this is the factor, okay? So uh, uh, for, for the one helix, this would be E1 over this sum. So they add up to zero. And so for the energy distribution, one again gets a binomial sort of expression which one can use. And then we can talk about, um, oh, I, I should say, uh, I want to eventually talk about how energy is then going to move in time. But uh, first is the question, the question that I raised before, <coughs> is this energy conserved? Well, when you do these calculations in a straightforward way, you get that it's not quite conserved. These are the factors for the total energy. So this would say that <coughs> um, uh, we have more energy in the result than we had, had at the beginning. On the other hand, this neglected um, the fact that the, the structure we started with is already part of the cascade and is interacting with other structures. And we, we found a way to sort of correct for that. And if you do that, you get values which are pretty close to one. Um, I don't put a lot of stock in these calculations because of all the assumptions made, but I think it's fair to say that we're not uh, grossly uh, abandoning conservation of energy in this cascade. That's all I really would like to say. Um, so uh, finally, let, let me just talk briefly a bit about uh, 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 trying to think about an initial value problem. So let's start off with the helix and turn it loose and then just watch what happens to the energies. And uh, to be quick about this, it's, it's it's not complicated. We have to have a time that each vortex lasts and we're going to use the local, the inverse of the local vorticity to do that. And so we'll, we'll keep track of that. Okay, so that's what these expressions are talking about. So as the, 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 the vortex stretches, the, uh, the time will change. And since we're talking about two elements of a binary cascade, we can adjust the um, 
unit of time to make uh, the uh, proportional waiting time in terms of the vorticity of that particular vortex unity, then we have to have another parameter for the other vortex, presumably it does the, the uh, measure of, of its time given about the invert, inverse vorticity is not quite the same, so we introduce another parameter. Uh, anyway, um, then we, we turn this thing loose and we assume at a given step of the cascade that the energy is essentially removed. Now, I'm thinking in terms of really going way down the cascade here and then saying energy is, just disappears in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a puff of smoke. And so uh, this is happening at a uh, uh, complicated way because uh, of all this mixture of scales and times. And so depending upon what this capital lambda is, uh, this should be a capital lambda, you get various curves here, but they're sort of complicated. And if you blow them up, you, you find that they have a sort of de devil staircase, non uh, self similar uh, structure. So uh, this is sort of, I mean, in, in a way, this is not a very deep result. I mean, this has to come out of any cascade that is tracking small scales and carrying energy after all. But I think the interesting thing was how irregular this, this decay is. So this is sort of the model of, of, of this uh, anomalous dissipation, if you like. But of course, it's, it's, a, it's a, not a true dissipation because vertices, vertex structures dissipate in a complicated way by viscosity. And that has to be the real way that the viscosity has to be brought in. You can't just say the energy disappears. It disappears in a certain way, which involves reconnection, et cetera. And that's a very hard problem. There are models of Safman and others for, for, for the decay rate of uh, uh, free, freely decaying turbulence. Uh, I, I don't know how to do this. It would be nice to have some way of putting this into any model, but I don't know how to do it. Um, so I, that's all I was just saying. Uh, now, uh, to end up, I, I, I would like to, to just say a word about, about helicity. Um, uh, there's been no attention to this, and I've done some calculations. Um, uh, you can tell me if, if this is justified, but I, I first neglected the twist of these vortices and considered only the writhe and the, uh, uh, the linking, okay? And um, I find that a lot of the, the I mean, the, what really destroys you is the linking. We're really losing, we're not keeping account of Felicity because of the linking. And so uh, in a way, you know, it's sort of to be expected that the uh, helix, if, we, if, we're, if we're sort of uh, adopting a helix as the basic unit, it, it, it sort of has trouble to reverse itself for you <laughs> in a nice way. We could, of course, uh, wrap the helices in the opposite direction. So on average, I'm sure we can conserve helicity on, on average, but locally we can't. And so uh, I invite any ideas for how a structure might conserve both energy and helicity at a local level. Uh, two ideas along these lines. If you look at this, we have two oppositely signed rings. Um, you might want to adopt, and this comes back to uh, what Keith was bringing up earlier, uh, how, how can you possibly split uh, in this way? Uh, if we look at the, uh, the, uh, the experiment involving elliptic instability, uh, this splitting off uh, produces, could be regarded as producing two rings. We have to do some uncomfortable uh, surgery here to make nice rings from this. But this, if this were a piece of a ring, <clears throat> then you could imagine a model where you have rings upon rings, okay? And this would then uh, become not only a fairly plausible instability, but would also perhaps conserve helicity. That's one, that's one point. 
the other point is that in the present model, uh, we can uh, consider another model in which uh, a root helix splits into a one helix and two twins with the same beta zero volume fraction. And this gives very similar results, but we were left with two vertices which could wrap in opposite directions if you want to do something like that and more or less try to, to emulate this. So um, if, if I can sort of, Keith, perhaps you can discuss this now, but uh, uh, the, uh, the sort of splitting process to form a helix, if you could imagine it uh, is a sort of picture which could really represent maybe uh, smaller scale uh, instabilities on the model, which is sort of in aggregate looking like what you get from, from, from a helix. If you can see what I mean, it, it's, it, it's not, in other words, these things are really coming locally, but you could think of them as say uh, two helices, if you, if you repeat the structure, as two helices wound in opposite directions, something like that. Anyway, it's it's a it's a bit of a stretch, but but that's sort of the the, the possibilities that come to mind. Uh, finally, uh, let me just summarize the main the main result here is that we're, we're sort of in this model forced to consider a, 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 a mixture of two kinds of, uh, of, of two processes going on and interacting in a certain way. Uh, the agreement, I, I, I didn't mention this before, but as we vary this parameter S0 to get good agreement with experiment, we hit the curve, I mean, with an error that's only, in, I think uh, in, in uh, the L2 norm, 10 to the minus three. I mean, we really hit, hit this curve. Uh, and so there, there's something going on here that I would like to understand about the interaction of uh, of multiple ways of uh, dividing up vorticity that I think is it, it could be of interest anyway that's I'll, I'll stop here and take any questions but thank you thank you thank you Steve a wonderful talk so I welcome questions from the audience Keith maybe you want to go back to your point come on Keith. well um, yes uh, Somehow, in some ways, this you know rem reminds me of um, James Clerk Maxwell and his approach to electromagnetism in the early 1860s. He had a toy model, you know, with all sorts of little wheels and gadgets. <laughs> <into them. laughs> okay, but then <laughs> some years later, he realized he could actually throw away the model. What mattered was the underlying equations that he derived in the process. And the model became irrelevant. Nobody now thinks of the model, but we do, of course, think of the Maxwell's equations. They're absolutely fundamental. But, and that's how he arrived at them. Now, I just wonder how crucial your theory is. I don't think it is to the details of this model. As you say at the end, the, the essential thing is that there are, there are two cascades sort of in some way interacting with each other, and uh, in some ways perhaps competing with each other, I don't know. But that's what leads to the interesting result, the agreement with the, um, the Scheer-Levesque um, curve, uh, which is the main achievement. Of course, probably lots of other tests that one could impose to see, uh, you know, how good it is in other respects. But I wonder how, how crucial this very detailed model you have of vortices. Actually, they're more like um, double helices, aren't they? Which is in, interesting in its way. Um, yeah. How crucial that is to the background idea. That, that I, I, I am completely with you on this. Uh, uh, I, um, I, I, I mean, I, I think a toy model uh, is just what you say. Um, you hang your hat on certain things to just to get you going, uh, and see where it leads. And if it leads in the right direction, I think you'll realize it was all totally unnecessary uh, to 
particular to pick this particular uh, structure to get you going. So um, yes, um, I, I wish I knew what the, the the right answer would be, but I'm sure you look at the inertial range. If we could probe, and of course the McCoon experiments are probing. Suppose we could really probe down to enormous Reynolds numbers and really see how this keeps going. Uh, it might be possible to to see something that, uh, if, I mean, if you could, uh, uh, let me put it this way, that the problem here uh, is, is that uh, the dynamics involves the Beals of Orla. All vorticity is affecting all other pieces of vorticity. Uh, everything is going to be screwed up. If you could unscrew it and take a look at the constituent elements, uh, then you might see something that's rather pretty. Uh, you'll probably never see anything really pretty uh, looking at uh, uh, the Eulerian dynamics of the inertial range. Uh, and so I, I would think that to, to get back to your point, Keith, uh, I absolutely agree with you. Um, uh, in retrospect, um, I would like to to find uh, a whole range of maybe objects that would do the same thing, so to speak. Yeah, uh, very good. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? If I may ask one. Sure. Go ahead. Um, actually, I have a couple of questions and a comment. Uh, okay. One is that in your model, does both the cascade have to be a direct cascade? I'm sorry. Does the size of the cascade matters? In the model, you consider two cascades. Yes. Uh, both of them have to be direct cascade, or can one of them be inverse cascade and the other one direct cascade? I, I... Maybe the question was unclear. No, no, I, I understand. You're asking that one could be an inverse cascade. Yes. By that, you, by that you mean unstretching the vortex? Uh, no, the reason I ask is the following. So there is an old paper in the 92 of Wallef in physics of fluids, where he looks at the triad interactions yes. and divides them into four classes yes. and says that two of them gives a cascade that goes in the inverse way. Uh -huh. And one of them gives a cascade that goes in the direct way. Okay. And this classification of the triads also are connected to the helicity that comes from the triad. Well, that's interesting. I, I would, I, you got to send me another reference. <laughs> okay. But, I, I can write it. I can write it in the chat. This is. I can write it in the chat. Yeah, but anyway, so uh, was, that's, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Uh, he had four pieces to the cascade. You say, depending on the four different way you can arrange the triads. Yeah. yeah. He has four different ways of cascading and mm -hmm. two of them give an inverse cascade. Mm -hmm. One of them give a direct cascade and one I am not sure maybe it was not settled. Now I well, would well, like to see that. Yeah. I will I will do that. But one interesting thing that happened later was that some people in simulations basically turned off all the triadic interactions except certain ones. This was Biferale and his group. And uh -huh. they found that in 3D, you can get an inverse cascade, which is very strange. Uh -huh. Very so interesting. When you, were, when you were talking about two cascades, this is the one I was thinking about. I see. Uh, but, but this may be a completely wrong direction, so I have no clue. I would think it would be hard I mean, just offhand, having played around with some of these things, to have two cascades, one of them inverse. I, I, uh, but, but in the beta model, it doesn't really matter, right? That's right. It's only going one. It's only going one one direction. The beta model. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 there's a part of the fluid you're not, not 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 dealing with. Basically, you're looking at a right. one or smaller volumes of fluid in the beta model. And, so the, okay. the other related, not related, the other question is that you are using zeta 3 equal to 1 
to constrain the model. Yes. There is another another result that we know, which is that the zeta p versus p curve must be convex. Does that a... give you some? The zeta p versus p curve must be a convex curve. Okay, well, it is convex here. So, but uh, but I'm saying is, can you use that to put some inequality on the two betas? Uh, I think there's some discussion of that in Frisch's book, isn't there? Uh, so, uh, uh -huh. I've seen I've seen some. Yeah. Okay, I have to I have to read. Go back and read that. Yeah, no, but I, I, I've heard of this, uh, I'm trying to estimate this. But what is the point here, though? I mean, uh, you mean that we could... Uh, I mean, maybe I'm one could say that because you have two different betas on the cascade, right? Two different be betas. I mean, your, your cascades have beta no, one and beta two. This is not a bifractal model. It's, it's not a bifractal model. Right, that's right. Yeah. But, Maybe maybe I misunderstand the situation. Okay, I am done. Yeah, yeah no, I appreciate your remark. I um, uh, I mean, there's this question of, of multifractal. Uh, what we are looking at here is a multifractal by definition because it gives the concave curve. That's what a multifractal is supposed to do. That's and any, any I, such result is interpretable as a multifractal. I I agree with that. The, uh, what the, I mean is. In the multifractal, you typically have something like an F alpha curve, which is the Lysander transform of the zeta p versus p curve. Yes. But here you are not going that way. No. You are, you are thinking of two different cascade, and they have their own properties, and you are bringing them together to make the multifractal. That's right. And you are using, so, and you have one constraint, which is that zeta 3 should be 1. Yes. Which is giving you one handle on the parameters. Yes. Now, the fact that the zeta p versus p should be convex, does it give you some more handle or is that not useful anymore in within this model? I don't see that it's useful within this model. Okay. Hang on. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I am done. Thank you for Excellent. the references. I, I put that uh, excellent talk, by the way. I appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions? I have a very naive uh, sort of question comment. Uh, is, uh, well, of course, handedness uh, has a role in elicity. And uh, I just was surprised in uh, in seeing uh, your let's say cascade of helical structures of one um, say one signature to the next etc cetera, etc cetera, not to giving uh, information on helicity that's a bit of a surprise you should have a lot of helicity actually it's like a dynamo model there <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what 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 you what any comment uh, wait we we do have a lot of felicity. We're not doing a very good job of conserving it. Is the problem? Sure, uh, sure. Uh, but well, that's uh, because... go ahead. Go ahead. I know. Uh, I don't want to spoil the model, but uh, if I interpret your bifurcation as a uh, one one handed, say left hand and right hand, left hand and right hand, maybe maybe you would have a, a way to. Uh, to uh, kind of control helicity uh, rather than having a continuous input of uh, one handedness in the model, but this is just well, the intuition. Yeah, we can we can do that. I mean, it, uh, the the orientation it doesn't come into the model, so half of these could be one way, half the other way, and uh, helicity in that sense, the linking number <clears throat> would be conserved very nice. I mean, we would have zero linking number. So we, we can conserve helicity that way in average, but that's all. Um, so uh, the individual steps are not very, in other words, it, it doesn't represent a very realistic instability as Keith was pointing out. Uh, right. Well, one, so, one physical feature that I can see in your, in your model is that uh, as uh, you increase uh, 
helicality, so to speak, uh, then uh, you may have torsion that g grows and grows and uh, higher, uh, higher gradients of uh, curvature are likely to be killed by viscosity as you increase this cascade uh, process. So that, that is, in a sense, uh, it seems consistent, consistent with the role of viscosity in, uh, in eroding uh, structures. That's very interesting. I, I, uh, I, I, would, I would hope that somebody would come up with a model, which, um, and this is, you are the expert, you and, and, and Mitch Berger and many others that have looked at these things, and Keith, of course. And uh, I would say, uh, if you could take a, a, a tube composed of smaller tubes um, and make them as small as you like, and then follow this cascade and follow the inside and so on and, and deal with the twist uh, as well as the, the, the writhe and the linking. It would be very interesting to see what comes out. I don't have a feeling for that myself. Um, and uh, I, it could be that I'm, I'm really missing something that uh, uh, is, would, would uh, be very beneficial to con constructing a more realistic model. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, there is a point here. There, there's very recent work by Beranger de Brule and colleagues at Saclay in, in uh, France in Paris. It was one of the lectures that was given last week at the Bachelor uh, Centenary yes. meeting. And um, the right. yeah, well, they they found um, that they were looking at extreme events in turbulent flow, actually in the VKS experiment, you know, which is uh, turbulence generated by two propellers. And um, they find actually that um, the stretched Berger's type vortex is very uh, crucial that they can, it seems that most extreme events can be explained in terms of um, such stretched vortices perhaps interacting with each other, uh, but it's, it's an issue that is of really great current interest to identify these uh, extreme events. Yeah, uh, that, that was one of their conclusions. It's interesting we have these extreme events here. In fact, I didn't show it, Keith, but we, did, we computed the PDF uh, of our cascade, uh, of, of, of our turbulence, so to speak. And it looks very much like the the ones you see for turbulence. I mean, it it, it has that uh, sort of extreme event shape, getting away from Gaussian. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's it's definitely uh, it's part of the picture. I think. I think a lot of things are a lot of theories are pointing in the same direction in, in some ways. Very nice. Yeah, very nice. I'll, I'll look at. I have I have that paper of her. Uh, and oh, yeah, good. Yeah. Mm. Okay, if no further questions, uh, thank you very much. The wonderful talk. Thank you. My, my pleasure, everyone. Thank you for coming.